So remember, we left off the last time. We talked about some of the pros and cons of um, the uh, resistivity method. You know, one was we had to have electrodes uh, in injecting current directly into the subsurface. Um, if the surface is low resistivity, you may have trouble getting current uh, flow into the intervals of interest. And also, you know, you have to put all those electrodes in the ground. You have to move them around. It's pretty time consuming. Uh, the resistivity method is more versatile. It's one of its assets. You can put as many electrodes in as you want, and you can get a lot more detail, a more detailed view of subsurface resistivity, uh, conductivity uh, variations. So this is probably the primary benefit, um, getting a more comprehensive data set, uh, getting a more detailed view of subsurface resistivity variations in the zone of interest, the problem that you're, you happen to be dealing with. So some of the conventions here, uh, you know, this is again kind of a, one, of my, one of my sloppy, uh, lazy diagrams here, just a chalkboard uh, view. We've got a source electrode, a sink electrode, positive and negative. Uh, again, the current flow direction is considered to be the direction in which the uh, positive charges move, and so if these are electrons, they'd be moving in this direction. These um, uh, charged particles are moving in, in this direction. So, uh, again, the idea is that we have something, this could be contamination within a reservoir, it could be, oh, some geological feature that you're interested in. Um, locating that has uh, a resistivity contrast. You usually have to think about that in advance. You, you do have to be looking for things that have a contrast in resistivity. Uh, but the idea is that we're looking at current flow and we're measuring the potential difference between the electrodes that we poke into the ground uh, at this point, comparing it with the potential difference that we measure at this point, and this point, this point, and so on. Uh, mapping out the distribution of this uh, feature of interest. Um, by convention, uh, field lines, we have field lines emerging from positive charges and uh, field lines converging on the negative charges. And that should look familiar to you, pretty familiar to you from your your basic uh, physics. And, you know, remember, like charges repel. Uh, so two uh, negatively charged particles are going to push each other away. A negative and a positively charged particle are going to pull, going to be attracting each other. So. so the basic setup here, we've got a source, uh, basically considered to be a positive electrode. We have a sink. It's considered to be an, a negative electrode. So uh, we have current emitting from the positive electrode flowing through the ground, coming back into the sink. And so the current flow direction is considered to be from the source to the sink. And it's again considered to be the direction of positive charge flow. So current basically is a charge flow rate. It's a change in the charge flowing through a region over a certain amount of time. And in a differential sense, it would be dQ dt or delta Q delta t. I is your current, Q is your charge, t is the time difference. And, and remember, our uh, conductor, we can kind of think of it as a, as a um, <clears throat> uh, just, just a wire, a uh, certain cross-sectional area, a certain length. And uh, uh, you'll may want to go back to the discussions of terrain conductivity just to kind of review the relationships between resistivity and um, um, the length of the conductor and the cross-sectional area. Uh, you know, remember that it's uh, uh, proportional resistivity varies in proportion, or resistance varies in proportion to the length of the conductor and inversely as the cross-sectional area. So if we want to know something like, well, okay, how, how fast are these charges actually moving through the um, conductor? Uh, that's a problem that we can attack, and it, it kind of reveals a few things about uh, the process. So if we have a conductor, this could be 
a poor throw. This could be, you know, a, a flow pathway uh, within a, a rock, for for example. We've got a cross-sectional area A on average. We've got all these charges in here. The total charge and flowing through the area in time delta t. That would be our current. So if we just take a look at a length L of the conductor with all the charges packed in there, that cross-sectional area A, delta Q is just the total charge in this area, and it's going to be the number per unit volume, which would be the total number times the volume. So that would give us the total charge in this area. And the volume is just going to be equal to the length times the area up here. And um, <clears throat> L is just going to be equal to the drift velocity on average. You know, these, these particles are going to be bouncing around very, very, very quickly. But on average, when we set up a potential difference between this end and this end, they will move as a whole. They will drift at a certain rate, at a certain drift velocity. And this length, they would traverse this length in um, a time delta t, and the drift velocity times the time, it, you know, the interval over which you're making the measurement would give you the length of the conductor, and the volume then would be equal to the length times the area, or the drift velocity times delta t times the uh, area. So down here we have n number of charges per unit volume. And then we're going to express the current flow, delta Q, delta T, as equal to the charge times N, not of N. So I'm just kind of breaking up the different terms here. So it would be Q times N times the, um, <clears throat> times the volume, uh, the number per unit volume. Uh, so the volumes are going to cancel out, right? The delta T's are going to cancel out. So we end up with uh, the number per unit volume times the charge of an individual particle times the drift rate times the cross-sectional area would be equal to the current. So, you know, in, in geological materials, uh, current flow is pretty complicated. You know, it's not like um, electrons flowing through copper wires. So we have, um, car we have uh, carbonate ions, we have calcium ions, sodium, uh, hydrogen carbonate, and so on. So each of these ions has a charge, Q sub J, and there will be a certain concentration per unit volume associated with each ion. So we have an N sub J in there. And then we have a drift velocity for each of these different ions. So current then becomes a, a more complicated expression. So it's a summation of all these different um, uh, currents associated with the different ions that we have in solution, dissolved in solution. So here's a problem. Uh, you've got a copper wire, so we're back to something simple now. We just, we're dealing with electrons. Uh, we've got an area which is one millimeter squared. And uh, so, you know, a thin wire. It's carrying a current of one ampere. And so we have uh, electrons. They have a charge of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 18th coulombs. And then we also have the number. Remember, this is in that... Uh, formula, and QVA, a number per unit volume here is 10 to the 27th electrons per cubic meter. So we're going to have to be units consistent here, aren't we? So, so the question is to compute the drift velocity of the electrons flowing through the wire. And if you've forgotten, uh, back to your basic physics, an ampere is one coulomb per second. So we just have this formula for the current. Uh, it should be a small i. And uh, so you might take a minute and ask yourself how fast the electrons are moving through this copper wire. What is their drift velocity? What do you think? Speed of light? Almost the speed of light? Very, very fast. Very, very fast? Good question. Well, we can answer it. I is equal to the number per unit volume times the charge times the drift velocity times the cross-sectional area. Uh, all these parameters we have now. So we just go through a uh, rearrange to calculate the drift velocity. 
We know what the current is. It's one ampere uh, over the number times the charge times the cross-sectional area. And you have to uh, make, we have to be units consistent, so we've got to change millimeters to uh, meters. So that gives us, in terms of the area term here, uh, millimeters squared equal 10 to the minus 6 meters squared. So another question is, what did you find? Uh, if you tried to work through this problem here, what did you come up with? Well, it doesn't look like they're really, you know, if you gaze up at the light uh, on your desk, in the ceiling, 6.25 millimeters per second. Not really very dramatic pace. Um, kind of creeping across the, uh, creeping through the uh, the wires very slowly. So the next time we're going to talk about Ohm's law, a lot of what we do with resistivity methods is, you know, just comes back to the simple equation uh, where the potential difference is. Um, uh, equal to um, the current times the resistance. And we know that the resistance, we talked about this before, the resistance is, is associated with more basic properties, uh, specifically the resistivity and the geometry of the conductor, uh, the length of the conductor over the cross-sectional area of the conductor. So rho is our resistivity. And also recall that... Uh, Rho is equal to 1 over the conductivity. And uh, so we have, we could also write this as uh, potential difference is equal to the current times conductor length over conductivity times cross-sectional area. So we'll talk more about these relationships and how they help us uh, uh, develop uh, analytical methods for the resistivity technique uh, next time. Talk to you later.